This is the uh, final um, Mellon Sawyer seminar of the um, academic year, though I expect uh, that we will be having another uh, mini conference organized by Adam Ettenson, our postdoctoral fellow, uh, sometime soon. Um, but we will s definitely send out word about that, and Josh uh, Keaton is also participating in organizing that. Uh, that will involve as well, uh, an, some outside speaker and some of the fellows who don't yet know that they'll be called on to participate. Um, so uh, I just want to, uh, since this is um, our last um, session, um, I did want to once again thank um, everyone that's been very helpful in this. I guess I should start with the students who've uh, come each time, and I'm very the Mellon Fellows, who have been uh, quite a loyal uh, contingent, and the uh, faculty fellows from the area. We are very grateful that you've been able to come on a regular basis. Uh, on behalf of the co-organizers, who include uh, Ruth O'Brien and uh, Richard Wolin and um, Omar Dabur, I want to um, thank um, the fellows, but also especially Adam Ettenson, our postdoctoral fellow for the year, and our RAs, um, Joshua Keaton and Adam McMahon. And um, many of these events, in particular this one, is co-sponsored by the Center for Global Ethics and Politics. And I'd like to thank Hugo Bereka, who is one of the motive forces behind our being able to uh, carry on as a center here at the Graduate Center. Um, I'd also especially want to acknowledge our graduate assistant, John McMahon, who is also our videographer. And you can find the videos uh, from, the, um, from the series online, and they're uh, really a uh, pretty interesting uh, set of fantastic events. I'm really delighted that we have such a stellar, distinguished uh, speaker to conclude the series. Uh, it's really exciting to have Will Kimlicka here. Um, who um, is the Canada Research Chair in Political Philosophy in the Philosophy Department at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, where he's taught since 1998. As many of you know, his research interests are diverse, but they are focused very much on issues of democracy and diversity from several perspectives, and in particular on models of citizenship and social justice within multicultural societies. He's published eight books, more or less, and <laughs> over 200 articles. Um, and he has recently received the 2000, well, in 2009, I guess, a Premier's Discovery Award in the Social Sciences in Canada. Uh, he's co-director with Keith Banting of the Multiculturalism Policy Index Project, which monitors the evolution of multiculturalism policies across the Western democracies. I guess there's been regress as well as progress. Um, but um, anyway, I should say that his most recent book, which is quite relevant to the topic of today's presentation, is called Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animal Rights. And the one right, that was uh, uh, 2000, well, just came out in 2011 and is now out in paperback from Oxford, uh, which he co-authored with his wife, Sue Donaldson. Um, the one before that was entitled Multicultural Odysseys, Navigating the New International Politics of Diversity. And among many other books, I should mention his very famous Multicultural Citizenship, A Liberal Theory of Minority Rights. So he's really in many ways the foremost theorist of multiculturalism and within democratic societies. So we're especially delighted um, to welcome Will Kimlicka to talk about cultural diversity and animal rights. Uh, let me just say that our procedure will be the talk with a short break, then the discussions, and then we have a super splendid conclu concluding reception, but it will be in a different location. It will be in the philosophy lounge this time and uh, following the procedure. So, Welcome, Will. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, th thank you, Carol, for, th for the kind introduction and for the invitation to come down. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I should just, as a word of apology, this is, a, is very new material for me. This is the first time I've tried it out, just, just finished writing it a couple days ago, and it's still in pretty rough form. Uh, but I hope, I hope you'll be able to follow it, and I look forward to your comments, because I'm still quite unsure about, uh, about the arguments. 
and actually, if I had it all over again, I would, I would give a slightly different title to the paper than was advertised. So I've, I now call it uh, Animal Rights, Multiculturalism, and the Left. Because this is what I'm actually really interested in, is what's the relationship between animal rights and multiculturalism in the thinking and the, and the practice of the left today. So uh, in many, uh, if you just look at a kind of list of the standard causes of the progressive left, left in the last 40 years, it's not uncommon to see animal rights listed as one amongst others of these causes alongside uh, gender equality, gay rights, disability rights, uh, multiculturalism, the rights of immigrants, uh, racial minorities and indigenous peoples, anti-poverty groups and so on. So all of these are seen as kind of paradigmatically progressive causes uh, that are fighting to emancipate historically subordinated and stigmatized groups. And so they're all often considered uh, social justice struggles. But although animal rights is often uh, mentioned in passing in such a list, it, that's actually quite misleading because I would argue the animal question is, is virtually invisible within the left today. So as Carl Boggs notes, animal rights discourse has scarcely entered into or altered the work of left progressive groups in the United States. Uh, and so in that sense, animal advocates have sometimes been described as orphans of the left, that they are, they're championing a, progr a kind of paradigmatically progressive cause, but their cause is shunned by other progressive movements. And this is actually isn't a new phenomenon. It was true of the old left. If you look back at the 19th century, early 20th century, uh, the same pattern exists. So John Sabinmatsu says, the, the left, with few exceptions, has historically viewed human violence towards animals with indifference. So this is the puzzle that I'm starting with. Uh, what, what explains the left's indifference to human violence against animals? Uh, and and I, I think this has something to do with multiculturalism, and so that's, that's the link with, with the seminar. Uh, so the way the paper is structured, I, I want to say something about the left, something about animal rights, and then something about the link to multiculturalism. Okay, so why has the left been indifferent to, to human violence against animals? Uh, I think the causes of that, the explanation for that has actually changed over time. So if we go back to Marx, uh, who, by the way, was completely contemptuous of animal rights movements, uh, he shared the, the view from, from Kant and Hegel that the intrinsic value of humanity is exclusively tied up with what distinguishes us from animals. Uh, and that nature, in, in, and for, for Marx, animals were included in nature, nature is just kind of the stage on which humans enact uh, their, their species power, the kind of Promethean species power uh, for self-conscious and creative cooperative activity. And so the result of this picture in Marx, several people have argued, that in, in Ted Benton's words, is a quite fantastic species narcissism. So that's, that's Marx's, that, that's the, uh, why Marx w was indifferent to animals, because he, 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 he had this view that the intrinsic value of humanity was tied up with this distinction between higher human capacities and merely animal functions. But that view, which was, which was very popular in the 19th and early 20th century, has, I think, been widely discredited on the left not because of the way it uh, uh, renders animals uh, outside the sphere of moral consideration, uh, but because of the way it leads to pernicious hierarchies amongst humans. So the, 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 the Marxian view that the intrinsic value of humanity derives from this capacity to self-consciously transform the external world uh, tends to privilege uh, men's productive labor over women's reproductive labor, and so feminists have, have, uh, have challenged that view. It tends to privilege able-bodied people over uh, people with disabilities, and so the disability movement has challenged that view. Uh, it ch tends to privilege European models of intensive agriculture over uh, indigenous schemes, of, uh, traditional schemes of subsistence production, and so it's been subject to, to waves of post-colonial critiques. So on, on the Marxist view, not all uh, at least for, for Marx himself, not all groups and cultures were capable or equally capable of engaging in this kind of Promethean mastery of, of the external world. And so the progress of history for Marx required allowing the most advanced of these masters to rule over the, uh, the, the lesser, those, those, those groups who were incapable of this kind of uh, Promethean mastery. So so on Marx's view, animals as biologically determined beings were incapable of participating in the progress of history, but so too, for Marx and Engels, there were some what they called historyless peoples, uh, 
There were some cultures that were not capable of participating in the progress of history unless they were conquered by the great nations. And so in a famous passage, Engels talked about how the conquest of these historyless peoples by the great nations of Europe is the right of civilization against barbarism, of progress against stability. It's the right of historical evolution. Okay, so th this, this, the, the left has rejected that, that old Marxian view because it, it, it generates and justifies a series of hierarchies amongst humans. And therefore, feminists, disability theorists, multiculturalist theorists, post-colonial theorists have challenged it. I think it's now almost universally rejected in the left, that idea that the intrinsic value of humanity lies in its capacity for this kind of uh, rational and self-conscious mastery of the external world and the transcendence of the merely natural or animal. I think it's widely accepted on the left today that there are multiple forms of human flourishing, multiple sources of value in our lives, and all of them are tied up with the fact that we are embodied creatures. That, that these forms of the good are inescap inescapably linked to our ontological existence as finite and vulnerable physical beings or to put another way, to the fact that we too are animals. We are human animals. So this new picture that I think is broadly shared on the left of the good of human lives should have opened up space to include animals in the left's conception of social justice. So on this new conception of the good of human lives, humans are not you know, disembodied uh, Cartesian uh, rational egos, and animals are not just mechanical automatons. Rather, we know that both humans and animals are conscious, feeling, communicative selves who are bound to other conscious selves through various webs of relationships and interdependencies, each with our own subjective experience of the world. And so in this sense, the human good on this new account is continuous with that of animals. And I think we can see this in a lot of the recent accounts on the left of, of the human good. So if you think about feminist ethics of care, for example, I think there's no intellectually credible account uh, uh, of the good of human lives in uh, uh, care ethics or of the moral significance of caring relationships in promoting that human good, which would not equally apply to animals. Similarly, if we look at capability theory of the sort that Sen and Nussbaum have developed in the global justice literature, there's no intellectually credible account of the good of capabilities and of fl flourishing and of the claims of justice that it gives rise to that does not equally apply to animals. And if we look at disability theory, I would argue, there's no intellectually credible account of the human good and of the role of interdependent agency in promoting that good that is not applicable to animals. And, I, I, and there are some, there are a handful, a, a very few theorists who have don, drawn precisely this conclusion, who have extended feminist, post-colonial, and disability theory to animals, uh, including Nussbaum herself, of course. Uh, and yet, as noted, these, these efforts to extend left theory to include animals have largely fallen on deaf ears. The vast majority of the left, whether they self-identify as feminist, post-colonial, multiculturalist, critical race theory, disability, cosmopolitan, queer, whatever, they continue to view human violence against animals with complete indifference. Okay, so what explains this? I, I generally find this a puzzle. Part of the explanation, I'm sure, is the depth of our cultural inheritance. So the, the three Abrahamic religions all assert that only humans were made in God's image and that, humans, and that animals were put on earth to serve human beings. So this is a deep premise of monotheistic religions. And even people who purportedly disavow religious arguments, I think, continue to be strongly shaped by that assumption that we, we share in some divinity and animals are here to serve us. Uh, another part of the explanation uh, is that accepting animal rights is likely to involve some quite painful and inconvenient changes to one's personal life. People may simply not want to, may not be ready to give up their favorite meat dishes or leather shoes. And in order to avoid having to confront such challenges, they simply avoid thinking about the ethics of our treatment of animals. So I think both the depth of our cultural legacies and the difficulty of the personal sacrifices involved are probably uh, stronger in relation to animal rights than in relation to, say, gay rights, possibly. And I think that helps to explain why so many people on the left resist animal rights, despite what I take to be the logic of their own normative commitments. Uh, so, so, I, so put another way, I think people on the left are not immune to both species narcissism and self-interest. And, and these are both reasons for ignoring the claims of animals that, are, that cut across the, the ideological spectrum. Uh, but I do think there's also a distinctively left motivation 
for ignoring animal rights or resisting animal rights, which is the perception that advocating for animal rights will end up harming the struggles of other disadvantaged groups. Uh, and that's the perception that I want to explore and unpack. It's a very widespread perception, but I think it, it, it needs to be carefully parsed and assessed. Okay, so let me start with one uh, manifestation of this anxiety uh, from here in academia. Uh, so in, in, in fields like sociology, there has been a struggle to create a recognized subfield of animal studies. And, uh, and this has been a struggle. So in, in sociology departments uh, in, across North America, it's not uncommon for there to be such recognized subfields for a wide range of oppressed groups. So there's African American studies, Latino studies, women's studies, disability studies, gay lesbian studies. These have all been uh, accepted into uh, the practice of, of the discipline of sociology, but attempts to add animal studies have, have been quite strongly resisted, not primarily or exclusively by mainstream or right-wing sociologists who are skeptical about all of these forms of, of uh, subfields, but rather from precisely from the defenders and advocates of these other area studies for oppressed groups. So that it's precisely the defenders of African-American studies or women's studies who have been fighting against the recognition of animal studies. Uh, and Arnold Arluk has written an article about this fight. Uh, suggest, he, he, he suggests a number of reasons for this conflict. And uh, he mentions a couple that I want to briefly discuss and then I'll, I'll give my own slightly different explanation. So, so the first uh, suggestion that Arluk makes uh, is what we could call a displacement concern. So the picture here, and this is a long-standing one, is the idea that, that struggles for justice are a kind of zero-sum uh, uh, phenomenon, that the more time and energy and resources we invest in fighting for one form of just injustice, the less time and energy resources we have for fighting other forms of injustice, because uh, it's zero sum. And this assumption that struggles for justice is, are zero sum has been used historically uh, to, 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 to defer uh, uh, and to, 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 to um, uh, diminish a wide range of struggles for groups. So for, for a long period of time, the old left argued against women's rights or against uh, uh, the rights for blacks on the grounds that those distract attention from the more fundamental class struggle. Right? This is an old familiar argument in the old left that, we, that it's a distraction to be focusing on gender or race when we should be privileging the class struggle. And again, that, this line of argument has essentially been rejected by the left we, we're not on the left. We no longer accept that struggles for justice are zero sum in this way. On the contrary, identifying new forms of injustice are seen as uh, strengthening the salience of justice generally in society. Uh, that uh, that identifying one form of injustice doesn't mean occlude other forms of injustice, but rather uh, helps to, to to render salient justice more generally. Uh, and moreover, that these forms of injustices uh, we we assume are linked in various ways that they're, they're, they're interconnected. They're rooted in similar practices, similar ideologies uh, of domination, similar uh, processes of exclusion, silencing, paternalism, and, and coercion. Uh, and so that highlighting new forms of injustices helps to re reveal another strand in this interconnected web of oppression. Uh, and, and that's important and helpful in a allowing a more informed and effective advocacy. So this is the heart of the idea of intersectional analysis, which is very widespread in contemporary left theory and politics, as against the idea that we should privilege one struggle at the expense of while ignoring or deferring others. And so when, animal, when the defenders of animal studies uh, uh, push for the recognition of their field, they are extending this left commitment to intersectional analysis, at least that's the way they see it. So that's one concern, the, the displacement concern. A second concern uh, Arluk mentions is what, I could call, what we could call the trivialization concern. So the idea here is that uh, including animals in the, in the pantheon of, of the left, of the left causes, will diminish the very currency of justice and thereby erode the moral seriousness with which human injustices are treated. So that if we add the liberation of animals from oppression and enslavement to the left's causes, to the left's causes, the result will be to debase the very currency of liberation, emancipation, oppression, and so on in human contexts. So the way Arluk puts it, 
uh, he argues that the, the defenders of, uh, the critics of animal studies in sociology, the left critics of, of animal studies, see animal studies as a parody of their specialty because interest in non-human animals somehow tarnishes or cheapens whatever group they champion and in their mind trivializes the very notion of oppression. Okay, so there are two, it seems to me there are two ways of interpreting this trivialization concern. One is a philosophical claim about the objective moral significance of different forms of injustice and the existence of a steep moral hierarchy between human and animal injustices. So on this view, human injustices just are objectively much, much more serious than injustices against animals, and that if we apply concepts of oppression and liberation to animals, we trivialize those concepts because harms to animals are objectively simply of trivial moral significance. Okay, so that's, that's one interpretation of this trivialization concern, and obviously it just begs the question against uh, animal rights advocates. Linking human and animal oppression is insulting to humans only if one starts already with a commitment to species narcissism, which assumes that the good of a human life is radically discontinuous with and superior to that of other animals. If one starts instead with a view that emphasizes our good as conscious, feeling, perceptive, communicative, and embodied beings, then our good is continuous with that of many animals, as are the harms and vulnerabilities we face, and there's nothing inherently insulting or trivializing in attending to those commonalities. And it's precisely this conception of the human good uh, which is broadly shared in the left, rejecting both kind of the kind of Marxist Promethean view or Judeo-Christian divine creationism. So, it's, so on what basis then can the left view the linking of hum animal and human rights as trivializing? It just seems to presuppose that animals are trivial rather than giving any argument for the indifference to their, to their well-being. Okay, so, I, I, so viewed as a philosophical claim, I say it just, it just begs the question. But we, we can interpret the trivialization concern not as a philosophical claim, but as a sociological claim uh, uh, based on an empirical prediction about the impact of support for animal rights on the broader public's commitment to human justice. So you could imagine someone on the left saying, Okay, I personally don't see anything insulting about uh, uh, linking the oppression of humans and animals given the, the continuities and their goods and in the harms that they suffer. But, but if the broader public starts to weaken or dissolve the moral boundaries between humans and animals, the result, one might fear, will be to weaken the public's commitment to upholding the fundamental rights, in particular of oppressed and disadvantaged groups, human groups. So the rights and status of privileged humans uh, isn't going to be threatened by extending rights to animals because privileged and powerful uh, humans are, are always going to be able to, to defend and assert their interests, their dignity, and their good. But, but disadvantaged and oppressed human goods, uh, uh, their status is always threatened. Uh, their right to a dignified existence is always vulnerable and constantly needs to be defended. And for such groups, some people argue, asserting a steep moral hierarchy between humans and animals is a crucial political resource. So the disadvantaged and oppressed human groups can best assert their right to a dignified existence by emphasizing the moral significance of their humanity and their categorical discontinuity with and superiority to animality. So in other words, sharing in human supremacy over animals, sharing in species narcissism, is assumed to be an effective tool for disadvantaged or oppressed humans. There may, be, it may be difficult to give a philosophical justification for this, for, for this steep moral hierarchy, but some people might argue, if that steep moral, moral hierarchy is put in question, disadvantaged and oppressed human groups will be more vulnerable to prejudice, stigmatization, dehumanization, and so on. Okay, this, this view that disadvantaged group, human groups benefit from the assertion of a steep moral hierarchy between humans and animals is very widespread. Uh, uh, so, so Claire Kim talks about how the, the civil rights struggle for African Americans heavily invested in what she calls the sanctification of, of, of species uh, differences, that, that the African American civil rights leaders uh, viewed it as really important to defending the, the equality of blacks to assert uh, human supremacy over animals. Uh, but it's an empirical claim, right? It's an empirical claim whether uh, the, the, the weakening of, a, of, a, of perceptions of a steep moral hierarchy between human animals will help or hinder uh, public support for uh, 
disadvantaged and oppressed groups. And it's striking to me how many people assert this argument without actually giving any evidence for it. And I believe it's almost certainly empirically false. The evidence, which is, there is evidence out there, no, just no one looks at it. The evidence suggests that those who draw the sharpest distinction between humans and animals are more likely to, to discriminate against outgroups of humans, precisely because of their species narcissism. The more people sharply distinguish between humans and animals, the more likely they are to dehumanize human outgroups, such as immigrants or racial minorities. Belief in human superiority of animals is empirically correlated with and causally connected to belief in the superiority of some human groups over others. So this has been studied. It's not, this, this shows up on survey evidence, but it's also been studied in experimental settings by social psychologists. So if you give, in these, in these experiments, if you give people arguments about human superiority, human superiority over animals, the outcome is greater prejudice against human outgroups. By contrast, uh, those who recognize that animals possess value traits and emotions that are continuous with those of humans are more likely to accord equality to human outgroups. Reduce, so in other words, reducing the status divide between humans and animals helps to reduce prejudice and to strengthen belief in equality amongst human groups. And there are actually multiple psychological mechanisms that link negative attitudes towards animals to the dehumanization of human outgroups. So I just think the left has invested heavily in what I take to be just an empirically false claim about the benefit for disadvantaged humans from species narcissism. Okay, so I don't see any compelling evidence for believing that challenging human supremacist ideologies will either displace or weaken commitment to justice for oppressed humans. The proposed dynamics of displacement and trivialization are both highly speculative. There's, there's little, if any, empirical evidence for, for either of these dynamics and much evidence against them. And this is precisely what one should expect for those on the left given the left's own commitments. So as I noted earlier, both the normative conception of the human good that underlies contemporary left theory and its methodological and epistemological commitments to intersectional understandings of oppression push us in the direction of recognizing continuities between human and animal injustice. So I just think it's, it's just theoretically unsustainable for the left to exclude the treatment of animals from our accounts of justice, power, oppression, care, flourishing, democracy, agency, and so on. Okay, so we're back again to the, to the original puzzle. What, what explains the left's indifference to human violence against animals? Why, why is animal rights advocacy the orphan of the left? So I think, so, so as I say, our Luke's, our Luke's explanation for the, for the resistance to animal studies is, is this displacement and trivialization concerns. I actually think the main explanation may be slightly different, which namely it's the specter of cultural imperialism. So this is the link to multiculturalism. So animal advocacy may uh, uh, be aimed at protecting vulnerable and powerless animals, but many people on the left worry that in practice it will end up reaffirming the privileged status of white middle-class Westerners while stigmatizing and disempowering minority groups and non-Western societies. So the concern here isn't simply the, the, the zero-sum idea that if we tend to animals, we have less time and energy for other groups, nor that it'll cheapen the currency of justice. That's the two, the two concerns I've already discussed. The concern, rather, is a, a more direct link between animal advocacy and racial hierarchy. The idea is that animal issues will become a metric or measuring stick that will be used to, to signify white or Western cultures as humane, as uniquely humane and civilized, while stigmatizing minorities and non-Western cultures as backward or even barbaric. Now, in one sense, this idea that the, the, animal, that the treatment of animals could be used to, to, to exalt uh, whites and Westerners as, as uniquely humane and civilized is bizarre, uh, because, I mean, uh, it's the West that invented the techniques for industrial scale exploitation of animals and then diffused those practices around the world. So if, if it's true, I mean, if the scale of animal exploitation is increasing in India, as it is, it has everything to do with the penetration of Western corporations and Western lifestyles into, into India and nothing to do with the local religious or cultural traditions. So, so viewed objectively, it's just, it really is bizarre to think that respect for animals is somehow the exclusive property of any one race, culture, or civilization, and certainly not of the, of the West. So, so objectively, it's a bizarre claim, but, but nonetheless, it's a claim that has been made historically uh, that 
uh, the treatment of animals, it, it is used as a way of marking whites or Western societies as, as humane and civilized. Uh, and uh, there's a long history in which dominant groups have justified their exercise of power over minorities or indigenous peoples by appealing to the backward or barbaric way they treat women or children or animals. So it, just as an example, William James said in 1876 as a quote, among the many good qualities of our Anglo-Saxon race, its sympathy with the feelings of brute animals deserves an honorable mention. And as Michael Lindblad notes, the animal advocacy at the time was connected in some ways to that, those sorts of claims. And so in, in Lundblad's words, uh, animal advocacy became a new and flexible discourse for claiming superiority over various human races, reinforcing the logic that only the more civilized groups had evolved enough to treat other groups humanely. Okay, so there's a long history of this, and many, many commentators continue to see these racial dynamics at work in contemporary political debates around animals. So one manifestation of this is about the sorts of animal harms that have been uh, singled out for public scrutiny. So there seems to be a tendency for minority animal practices to become the subject of high profile public debate and scrutiny. And one could quickly generate a long list of, of such cases. So let me just mention some of them. So think about uh, indigenous peoples and the whale hunt, so the macaw in the Pacific Northwest. Or think about uh, Jews and Muslims and ritual slaughter. Or the ritual sacrifice practices of the Santeria religion. Or uh, think about Chinese Americans and things like the live animal market in San Francisco's Chinatown or the sale of shark fin soup in Chinese restaurants, or think about Mexican Americans and horse tripping, or African Americans and dog fighting, or Korean Americans and eating dogs. In all of these cases, we have racialized minorities being told that their practices are cruel. Uh, the intention may be to, to improve the treatment of animals, to prevent certain kinds of harms, but the predictable effect, intended or unintended, is likely to reproduce some very pernicious and long-standing prejudices, that such minority groups are not really one of us, uh, that they don't really belong here, they're irredeemably foreign, that they're not worthy of full membership or inclusion, that they can't be trusted to be decent and humane, and therefore can't be trusted to govern themselves or to share in governing society generally. Okay, so I think there is this, I think this phenomenon exists uh, in, in contemporary societies as well as ex, uh, uh, historically. Uh, and, and it's exacerbated by the, by the, by the selectivity of, these, uh, of this focus on minority practices. So it seems like dominant, members of the dominant groups, they're, they're ignoring the ways in which they are directly complicit in the abuse of literally billions of farmed animals, captive and enslaved domesticated animals, while complaining about, say, the hunting practices of indigenous peoples or the ritual use of animals by religious minorities, even, those, even though those later, latter practices represent a tiny, tiny fraction of the abused animals overall in our society. And so this selectivity of focus is likely to operate to reproduce existing power relationships and to reproduce existing cultural and racial hierarchies. Okay. So so that's one concern, and I just, I'll come back to it, but I just want to flag that um, it, it wouldn't be, the, these high profile, these kind of media frenzies that we sometimes have about minority practices are rarely, if ever, the result of campaigns by animal rights organizations in the strict sense. So by animal rights organizations in the strict sense, I mean those organizations that are committed to the idea that animals have rights, in particular, the right not to be harmed and killed for the benefit of humans, so if you like abolitionists or liberationists. Uh, so, uh, and if we think about those, so, uh, I mean, one of the problems in this field is that the media often uses the term animal rights advocates for people who recommend any change in our treatment of animals. So even someone who believes that it's fully legitimate for us to be uh, uh, eating meat and to be raising pigs in intensive farms, if they campaign on the, on, uh, to, to, to ensure that pigs being transported to the slaughterhouse get water every 10 hours rather than every 20 hours, they're described as an animal rights advocate, even though they're in fact fully supportive of the uh, institutionalized uh, killing of animals for, for food. Uh, 
So, but, but I'm going to, from now on, I'm going to use the term animal rights only for those who actually believe that animals have rights, uh, and, who they're, and including the right, the, the, that animals have the right not to be harmed for, the, for a human benefit. So, so I'm thinking about organizations like PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, or Farm Sanctuary, or the Animal Liberation Front. Now, if we think about those organizations, they do not target minority practices. They target the institutionalized, commercialized exploitation of animals. So they're focusing on big uh, uh, agricultural uh, agribusiness. They're, they're, they're targeting pharmaceuticals. They're targeting biotechnology. Uh, uh, rarely, if ever, are they focusing uh, particularly or primarily on minorities. And in fact, I would argue, and again, I'll come back to this, that this, the fact that public debates, these high-profile public debates, focus on the cruelty of minority practices is evidence not of the efficacy of animal rights advocacy, but of its almost complete failure, right? From an animal rights perspective, there is no moral difference between eating dogs and eating pigs. These are both violations of the fundamental rights of animals. So from an animal rights perspective, this distinction between eating dogs and eating pigs has no moral, moral basis. The broader public, however, uh, doesn't accept the animal rights position. It accepts the principles that humans do have the right uh, to harm and kill animals for our benefit, so long as we do not involve cruelty or unnecessary suffering. So this is the framework in which the broader public debates animal issues. We have the right to harm and kill animals for our benefit, as long as we don't do so cruelly or with unnecessary suffering. And it's this framework which I think opens the door for cultural bias. So the idea, that it's, the idea that it's cruel to eat dogs and horses, but not cruel to eat pigs and cows, is just a cultural preference. It's just a cultural idiosyncrasy. It has no possible moral, moral justification. So too with the idea that it's cruel to kill chickens for religious sacrifice, in the case of the Santeria, but not cruel to kill chickens because we enjoy the taste of their flesh. Or the idea that it's cruel to hunt foxes, but not cruel to cage foxes in a fur farm. So the fact that the public mobilizes around these kinds of distinctions, that it, that it, it, it uh, identifies certain practices is cruel, often to the detriment of minorities, is evidence that animal rights principles and animal rights organizations have made virtually no inroads in public debate and public opinion. And, it, and that's not surprising. Since they've made virtually no inroads on the, in, on the left, you wouldn't expect them to have made any inroads on the broader public opinion. Okay, so, so this is one concern. That, 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 that I, I, I don't think it's fair to lay it at the feet of animal rights organizations, but it is true that public debate around animal practices often has, has a selective focus on minority practices. Uh, there's a second concern that is more specifically about animal rights organizations and, it, and about the way in which they promote their, their alternative to animal exploitation, their vision of a world without animal exploitation, uh, which is often... Uh, uh, captured by the, by the term, the, the vegan imperative. So anim, these animal rights organizations view it as a moral obligation for us to lead vegan lives. Uh, and it's off, the animal rights movement is often seen as implying that anyone can, with relatively modest effort, lead such a vegan lifestyle. And that, that view has been strongly criticized by many commentators for ignoring the, the fact that for some people, and for some groups, it may actually be very difficult and very costly in social and material terms for them to, uh, to adopt this vegan lifestyle. The, and and the, the assumption that a vegan lifestyle is easily accessible to all of us is an assumption that arguably could only be made from a position of cultural, racial, and economic privilege. And many people have argued that. Okay, so in both of these ways, the way in which the public, the broader public targets minority practices, cruel minority practices, and the way in which the animal rights movement itself commends a vegan lifestyle, in both of these ways, contemporary animal politics is often seen not just as presupposing a privileged white perspective, but also as reaffirming or re-legitimating those racial privileges, treating white perspectives as normative while ignoring the extent to which those perspectives are made possible by the oppression of others. So in short, animal advocacy is seen as performing whiteness. And in the paper, if people are interested, I have a long list of sources uh, in which people make this claim that animal advocacy is performing whiteness. And I think this is uh, one of the important explanations for the left's reluctance to embrace animal rights. I mean, I, th I think there is no, there's no greater sin on the left in North America today than performing whiteness. 
and progressive organizations will avoid associating with any cause or, cam or campaign that they suspect will be accused of performing whiteness. So, I mean, and, and this is understandable, right? Mainstream feminist, uh, 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 gay, disability, anti-poverty groups, all of these organizations have, over the last couple of decades, faced accusations of performing whiteness in their own uh, forms of advocacy, and they've gone through wrenching internal debates about how to include racial minorities in their work, uh, and having created what are still often quite fragile forms of inclusion uh, or alliances or coalitions with racial minorities, these organizations are very reluctant to embrace any cause that will jeopardize their alliances with racial minorities. And I think this is part of the reason why, why most feminist organizations are completely silent on the animal question. I mean, I, I, I should, so I, so, I mean, I, I think this concern, this, this, this idea that embracing animal rights uh, would lead to accusations of performing whiteness uh, is, uh, is often also used as a rationalization for people uh, to avoid thinking about the rights of animals. I mean, so I think some people are sincerely, for sincere and principled reasons, want to avoid complicity with any organizations or any discourse that they see as reproducing racial bias. But I think there are also a lot of people on the left uh, who, who invoke this, 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 this issue uh, of racial bias simply as a rationalization for persisting in their indifference to human violence against animals. So, saying that animal advocacy runs the risk of performing whiteness is, is a convenient excuse that I think many people on the left used. Uh, it's, it's basically the only politically legitimate excuse that's left for people on the left to, to continue to ignore animals. But anyway, whatever the mix of sincere belief or insincere rationalization, the perception that animal advocacy performs whiteness, I think, operates to keep animal rights advocacy as the orphan of the left. And if the left is, is to embrace animal rights, we need to directly and explicitly address this concern. So in Claire Kim's words, we need to overcome the belief already established among many progressive race activists and scholars that the animal liberation movement is white, politically speaking. That is, that it is composed of white people who are indifferent to and ignorant of racial justice struggles and whose activism reinforces white privilege. So we need, we need to find a, a form of animal advocacy that uh, acknowledges and, and is held accountable for its impact on racial hierarchies. So any, any credible, politically credible form of animal advocacy or post-humanism uh, needs to be attentive to and held accountable for its impact on racial hierarchies. So the way Mar uh, Manisha Decker puts it, we need a post-colonial form of post-humanism. But I would also insist, as, as does Decker, that any intellectual form of post-colonialism or anti-racism must also be post-humanist. That is, advocacy for racial equality must acknowledge and help be held accountable for its effects on animals. Okay, so I, I take it that this is, this is a priority project for the left, is to figure out a form of animal advocacy that, that's uh, consistent with, with uh, multiculturalism and anti-racism, and conversely, a form of multiculturalism and, and anti-racism that, that is uh, uh, held accountable for its impact on animals. So what would that mean in practice? What would a post-colonial, post-humanism look like? Uh, I think, so I think we need to distinguish different dynamics that are at play here, because they're going to require different remedies. So one, one dynamic that's at play is the explicit and intentional instrumentalization of animal issues. So the deliberate invoking of animal welfare as a pretext to bash minorities. So a clear example of this, I think this does exist in the world, a clear example of this would be, we can see in many, in Europe today, many far-right anti-immigrant parties have jumped on the issue of ritual slaughter. And they've jumped on the issue solely and exclusively because they want a stick to beat Muslims. Uh, these, these parties, so the English Defense League is a, is a classic case. If you go to their website, you can see the big campaign, part of their platform is a big campaign against ritual slaughter. Now, these, these parties have no track record, track record whatsoever of concern for animals. I think there's no evidence that they have any sincere concern for the well-being of animals. They just wanted an issue to bash Muslims. And in many cases, they only picked up on this issue of ritual slaughter because other issues that they they'd picked up first have been blocked. So they might first have been, and this is true, I think, in the case of the English Defense League, that they might first have wanted to ban minarets 
as a way of telling Muslims that you're not welcome, or to ban the burqa, but that they ran into legal obstacles on that issue, and so now they've picked up on ritual slaughter. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely insincere instrumentalization of the animal issue in order to justify uh, uh, racial, racial hierarchies and exclusion. So it's, it's, a, it's an instrumental use of animal welfare to reaffirm, reaffirm a sense of superiority over other cultures and peoples. So concern for animals is being used to re-legitimize human injustice. Okay, so that's a, that's a real phenomenon. Uh, and many, many um, members of minority groups think that that's always what's going on. Uh, many members of minority groups tend to assume that any criticism of their animal practices fits this picture of dominant majorities using hypocritical double standards to, to exercise oppressive power over minorities and to legitimate hierarchies. <clears throat> so Claire Kim in her in a series of articles has, has documented this. How, how this, this is, minority groups tend to immediately interpret all discussion of animal uh, practices in this framework as, in, as an instrumentalization to justify uh, majority dominance. But as I noted earlier, it would be implausible to ascribe such motives to contemporary campaigns by animal rights organizations, at least in North America. Their main focus has been majority practices, the treatment of animals within mainstream society, and in particular by powerful corporate interests. So as, as Claire Kim herself notes, precisely because they challenge some of the most powerful forces in US society, multi-billion dollar interests such as the meat and dairy businesses, pharmaceutical and biomedical research companies in the entertainment industries, animal advocates are ridiculed, marginalized, and criminalized. Uh, you know, they have these animal terrorist laws uh, and ag-gag laws here in the United States precisely because these, these animal rights organizations are targeting powerful corporate interests, not minorities. Moreover, when asked to comment on these high-profile debates about minority practices, animal rights organizations often explicitly denounce attempts to link the upholding of animal rights principles with justifications for nativism or claims about minorities' eligibility or worthiness for membership. So in, in her article on the live animal market, the, the Chinese live animal market in, in uh, San Francisco, Claire Kim says, I'll just read this short quote, charged with racism by Chinese merchants, animal advocates explicitly disavow any animus towards the Chinese people or culture. Animal advocates really don't sound like cultural imperialists. They do not trash Chinese culture, make comparisons that valorize American culture over Chinese culture, or call for the destruction of Chinese culture. They do not suggest that live animal markets are central to Chinese culture or somehow revealing of its essential barbarity. And she else, elsewhere talks about how animal advocates are no more interested in trashing immigrant cultures than they are in celebrating native culture, the dominant culture. It does not make a comparative assessment or assert that the majority culture is superior to the minority culture. Animal advocates do not stand within the majority culture passing judgment on the minority culture, but stand apart from and challenge the practices of both on behalf of animals who cannot defend themselves. So, so I, I, I think, and this is, this is Claire Kim's point, that minorities often too quickly assume that any, any discussion of the animal issue is, the, takes this instrumentalized form, ignoring the fact that for many animal advocates they are uh, um, not linking their advocacy of animals to any narrative about uh, the lack of worthiness or lack of, uh, of belonging of minorities. Of course, it's true that if animal rights groups succeed in raising the profile of animal issues, it opens the door for their deliberate instrumentalization, like with the English Defense League and the ritual slaughter issue. And even where there isn't deliberate instrumentalization, we can safely predict, we live in a, in a, in a, a society that has a deep and pervasive cultural and racial hierarchies, we can safely predict that the broader public and the media will, will perhaps unconsciously filter animal rights campaigns through the lenses of these inherited cultural hierarchies. And so we'll pick up those features of the campaigns that apply to minorities while ignoring those aspects that apply to themselves. It's just, we can just predict that this is the way the media will respond. They'll make high profile uh, issues around minority practices while ignoring majority practices. In societies with deeply entrenched racial hierarchies, such effects are predictable, and animal advocates need to be held accountable for them. I mean, this, this is, this is the, the, the Claire Kim's point. She emphasizes they are not, they are not instrumentalizing the issue, but they, they need to recognize and be held accountable for the way in which we can predict 
that, the, that uh, animal rights advocacy will get filtered uh, through these hierarchies in public debate and in the media. Okay, so that's, that's a very serious concern, but it's important to note that this danger is not unique to the issue of animal rights. We see similar forms of instrumentalization in relation to virtually every other progressive cause, such as, for example, women's rights or gay rights. Indeed, it's often the same right-wing parties that instrumentalize these other issues as well. So right-wing nativist anti-immigrant parties who have no track record of concern for gay rights have suddenly embraced gay rights. Why? Because they think it's a tool they can use to beat and embarrass Muslims. Okay, so we have the danger of instrumentalization in all of these contexts. And it's interesting to compare how the left responds to the risks of instrumentalization. In relation to women's rights and gay rights, the, left response, the left's response to the risk of instrumentalization is not to weaken their commitment to these rights or to disown their universality, but rather to denounce right-wing efforts to instrumentalize the issue and to take proactive steps to divorce the universality of moral principles from claims of superiority for particular cultures. So, for example, advocates for women's rights emphasize the contestability of beliefs and the heterogeneity of moral sources within every society, within every culture, as against essentialist and reifying or orientalist views that, that view gender equality as somehow part of the cultural DNA of the West while absent from the cultural DNA of other societies. Uh, advocates also work to establish checks and, balance, checks and balances to minimize the potential for selectivity and double standards. So they emphasize the need to create forums in which all groups can participate equitably in debating and shaping the relevant principles of gender equality and gay rights, conscious of the fact that these supposedly neutral spaces of dialogue and debate often privilege Western viewpoints. Uh, and, so, and so we need to take conscious, proactive efforts at inclusion, dialogue, cross-cultural learning and listening, a commitment to consistency and self-reflective inquiry and epistemic humility and conscious efforts to avoid tokenism, essentialism and exoticism. Okay, you're all familiar with this. This is the toolkit that the left has used to defend the emancipatory goals of gender equality and gay rights from the risks of instrumentalization and cultural imperialism. We have a long history of trying to develop these tools to, to protect and defend the emancipatory goals of gender equality and gay rights from the risks of instrumentalization. So if you like to create a form of post-colonial or multicultural feminism or post-colonial or multicultural gay rights. And it seems to me we can imagine the left, we, in principle, one could have imagined the left similarly embracing the struggle for a post-colonial animal rights agenda. And indeed, various authors have offered principles and toolkits for such an agenda, drawing explicitly on the lessons of post-colonial and multicultural feminism exploring how to connect the struggles against both human and animal oppression. And I see no reason to believe that these tools that we've already developed on the left, the principles and tools would be any less effective in relation to animal rights than in relation to human rights. Yet, the left has been indifferent to these calls to include animal rights in their intersectional analysis of and struggle against interlinked oppressions. And so, once again, the puzzle resurfaces. What explains the left's indifference to, to human violence against animals. It, it can't be the risk that animal issues will be employed to re-legitimize racial and cultural hierarchies because that risk applies to every one of the left's causes. Every cause of the left has, runs that risk of being employed to re-legitimize racial and cultural hierarchies. In relation to human injustice, the left's response to this risk is to make conscious efforts to defend the progressive aims of these causes against the danger of instrumentalization and cultural imperialism. It's only in relation to animal rights that this risk is invoked as grounds for weakening or deferring or simply ignoring the injustices involved. And it seems to me this is, the explanation for this asymmetry is simply the left's indifference to, to human violence against animals, which is theoretically unjustified, theoretically arbitrary. Indeed, I, I would argue that invoking cultural imperialism as grounds for indifference to animal rights is not only theoretically arbitrary, it's in fact counterproductive. If our goal is to reduce the political space for the instrumentalization of animal issues, then I think the worst possible outcome is to maintain the status quo with its conceptual framework of cruelty or unnecessary suffering. So this framework, uh, as many scholars have shown, is absolutely catastrophic for animals, but I would argue it's bad for minorities because the concept of cruelty and unnecessary suffering invites, and I think it actually makes inevitable, culturally biased mobilizations of animal issues. Practices involving cruelty are, by definition, those that are not customary in the, in the majority society. 
I, I want to emphasize, this is actually explicit in animal cruelty laws. Laws that prohibit animal cruelty explicitly exempt generally accepted practices in the mainstream society. And so by definition, the existing legal framework about animal cruelty can only target minority practices or individual psychopathy, indiv individual acts of gratuitous cruelty. Majority practices are inherently immunized from moral and political scrutiny by our existing legal framework. And, 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 and I want to emphasize that this is intrinsic to the legal structure we have at the moment. So it, it's inevitable that the majority cultural standard will serve, the, the, the majority's practices will serve as the normative standard for evaluating animal practices because if we, continue, if we continue to use this language of unnecessary suffering or cruelty, we are inherently, inherently privileging majority animal practices. Why? Because all human violence, almost all human violence against animals is unnecessary in the strict sense. Right? Human, humans can lead flourishing lives without eating meat, without wearing wet leather, without visiting caged animals in zoos or circuses. So none of the suffering involved in those practices is necessary in the strict sense. But of course, the existing legal and political framework isn't intended to ban those unnecessary suffering in, the, in that sense. Rather, it's intended to ban unnecessary suffering in the sense of deviation from the level of suffering involved in the generally accepted practices of the mainstream society. That's what animal cruelty legislation does. It, it, it bans deviations from the level of suffering of the generally accepted practices of the majority society. So the framework of cruelty or unnecessary suffering is inherently biased against minorities. From a legal and political perspective, nece necessary suffering is whatever we, the majority, do to animals in our generally accepted practices, whereas unnecessary suffering is whatever you, the minority, do to animals, particularly if we're not so keen on you, the minority, in the first place. So it seems to me that anyone who genuinely cares about racial and cultural hierarchies should be very concerned about this inherent bias in existing animal cruelty laws. And yet, remarkably, the left has no response to that concern. The left worries that embracing animal rights will involve complicity with racial bias and so remain silent about animal oppression. I believe the situation is exactly the reverse. It is precisely by remaining silent that the left is complicit in the perpetuation of a legal and political framework that is inherently biased against minorities. The, the framework of cruelty and unnecessary suffering is inherently biased against minorities. And the left says nothing about that. Of course, embracing an animal rights agenda would mean that both minorities and majorities would be required to give some ethical justification for their treatment of animals. And it's clear that minorities, like majorities, are very reluctant to give, that, to give an ethical justification for their treatment. And indeed, to my mind, this is one of the most striking features of the current, what I view as non-debate about animal rights in North America, how rarely either majorities or minorities make any attempt to give any ethical justification for the treatment of animals. So I've already explained how the, the framework of unnecessary suffering operates to immunize majority practices from ethical scrutiny, since customary practices are the default from which cruelty is measured. But in a perverse way, this framework also uh, gives defenders of minority animal practices an excuse to avoid ethical scrutiny. Now it's true, as I've just been saying, that this framework encourages the selective targeting and the biased targeting of minority practices. But precisely because it's selective, the minority's reaction to, to, to being singled out is typically to point out the arbitrariness and double standards involved. In other words, they don't respond, when, when their minority practices are challenged, they don't respond by explaining why their treatment of animals meets any test of ethical justification. They simply respond by saying it's no worse than what majorities do, and therefore shouldn't be singled out. So in other words, they interpret criticisms of their practices as an exercise of arbitrary majority power over the minority, and in the process, they feel no need to provide any justification for the way they exercise power over animals. So in this context, as Claire Kim, she, Claire Kim has this wonderful article called Multiculturalism Goes Imperial. So in this context, my, defenders of minority practices, by focusing exclusively on the relationship between majority and minority and that power relationship, they, they use that argument as a cover to immunize the exercise of power, their exercise of power over animals from any ethical accountability. So in short, neither majority nor minority is called upon today to justify how they exercise power over animals. I just think it's an amazing fact about, the, the, as I say, the non-debate. Uh, 
in North America. Embracing an animal rights agenda would have as its first task challenging this conspiracy of silence. Now, this kind of a conversation would be deeply uncomfortable for both majorities and minorities because animal exploitation is built deeply into the fabric of our societies. But the, I believe there's no reason to assume that such a conversation would conflict with or would erode multiculturalist commitments. It, it, of course, all of this depends on how one understands the content of our multiculturalist commitments. If you think that multiculturalism is about the right to perpetuate any practice, no matter what its ethical content, even if it involves the violation of, of human rights or animal rights. So, so if you think of multiculturalism about giving every group the right to maintain its practices, no matter what those are, including honor killings or female genital mutilation or coerced arranged marriages, then of course an animal rights agenda is in, is in conflict with multiculturalism in that sense, the right to maintain any practice, whatever its ethical content. But I've never, that's, never, that's never how I've understood multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, as I've understood it, is not about the right to maintain practices, whatever their ethical content. Rather, multiculturalism at its best operates to illuminate unjust political and cultural hierarchies, to decenter hegemonic norms, and to hold the exercise of power morally accountable. And viewed this way, I believe multiculturalism and animal rights are not at all in conflict, but flow naturally from the same deeper commitments to justice and moral accountability. And we have available to us tools and strategies for defending progressive causes, whether animal rights or human rights, against the danger of cultural imperialism. So, so I, 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 I want to acknowledge that embracing an animal rights agenda would lead to discomfort amongst minorities as majorities, and it would require dramatic changes to practices amongst minorities as amongst majorities, but I do not see that there's any deep normative commitment between an animal rights agenda and a multicultural agenda. Moreover, there's every reason to think that an animal rights-based conversation would be much more open to cross-cultural learning than our current framework of cruelty and, uh, and unnecessary suffering. The current framework predefines the customary practices of the majority as a default. But an animal rights-based framework delegitimizes majority practices and would immediately set us on a search for a new ethical framework for thinking about human-animal relations. I mean, the, the, you know, for, for centuries, uh, Western societies have defined animals as property. All of our concepts for talking about human-animal relationships are, are deeply uh, implicated in this property uh, framework. And so, you know, talk, whether we talk about livestock, whether we talk about pets, all of these are connected to the idea of animals as property. And an animal rights agenda immediately delegitimizes all, not just majority practices, but majority concepts for talking about human-animal relations. So we immediately need to go out and find entirely new categories for thinking about human-animal relations. And I believe that non-Western cultures and societies are going to be a rich source of ideas here. So uh, uh, whereas the existing framework of cruelty, unnecessary suffering, privileges and immunizes majority practices, animal rights and animal rights agenda delegitimizes, denaturalizes majority practices and enforces on us a requirement to look much more broadly for new ways of thinking about human-animal relations. Nor is there any evidence that the desire to end animal exploitation is limited to whites. The vast majority of the world's vegetarians are of course not white. I mean, 40% of India is vegetarian, which is massively dwarfs the numbers of vegetarians in any Western society. Uh, and, then, and even within uh, North America, there are no significant racial or ethnic differences in support for vegetarianism. And in fact, if anything, whites are underrepresented uh, amongst vegetarians. So, th so the conventional view that vegetarian veganism is, is a, 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 you know, restricted to affluent whites, it's, it's totally not true uh, looking at the, the data. So I think both the conceptual foundations of and support for an animal rights agenda is as likely to come from minorities and non-Western societies as from whites in Europe or North America. Okay, so just to conclude, an animal rights agenda would require a radical transformation of minority practices as majority animal practices, but I believe it's not therefore anti-multiculturalist. Like any defensible account of multiculturalism, an animal rights agenda would decenter and denaturalize majority practices, open up space for cross-cultural learning, and above all would shine a light on forms of power and privilege that have been immunized from ethical accountability. In this respect, as in many others, animal rights flow naturally from the normative and methodological commitments of the left, and it is increasingly difficult for me to see any credible grounds for the left's persistent indifference to human violence against animals. That's it.